open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. I thought before I go back into eschatology, I'd stop for a moment. And make sure we understand we're not going to go through the tribulation. You know, I said that, you know, one of the simple um, talking points on this is that we know that the seven judgments of seals and trumpets and bulls, which we have studied, are uh, just divine judgment. Um, for Christ, for the church to go through the tribulation, he would have to put all of that on the church, which means doing it all upon himself because he is the church. He is the savior of the body. Um, he is the head of the church. And so there's no way the church is going to throw through the tribulation. That would, uh, that's just absolutely insane to even think that. <clears throat> he, these are judgments that he could never bring upon himself. Listen, all the judgment upon him has been done. And therefore, it's not upon us. He carried our judgment. We'd have no more judgment. He's not going to put any judgment. I mean, this judgment is not about that. So. But there is a plus to that for us, and that is, that is uh, called the rapture of the church. So I want to make sure that we have some clarity on this uh, subject matter. Then we'll go back and talk about eschatology next time but it's important you know you come to study because you it's a, you want to know how to get from one day to the next day to the end and so you know I feel like it's you know for me it's I'm obligated as a pastor to do that with you and so while eschatology is interesting because it is a historical biblical historical piece that's important and it's the next on the schedule down the line Actually, the next on the schedule is the rapture. And uh, that could, listen, that could be, every one of us could be engaged in that before the night's over or, or even before the class is over. So, so I'm in 1 Corinthians. I want to go to 1 Corinthians 15. It's a great, you know, f um, two passages you always ought to connect, 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5. These are sister passages and they're very important um, but um, Paul talks about the the mystery of the resurrection uh, which is my I'm reading from my uh, heading in my study Bible <clears throat> And you'll see what he's talking about here in a moment. Now I say this, brethren, I'm in verse 15. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. <clears throat> so he's connected life to death and beyond. <clears throat> Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, see, the resurrection is no mystery to the Jew. You remember when Martha and Mary at their brother's funeral, Jesus comes in late. They're a little upset that he came in late. We called you early to come. If you'd have come early, we wouldn't have a funeral. We'd have a celebration. Remember that? <clears throat> uh, she declared, when he says, he, you know, I am the resurrection and the life, um, I am the, res oh, I know, Lord, we'll have a resurrection in the last day of business. And he said, no, 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 listen, you're not listening to me. Yeah, so, I mean, he introduced a, a, a whole different idea to the resurrection, didn't he? And the difference was connecting, instead of correcting it with some kind of prophecy of the last day, he connected to the cross. He connected to the gospel. You understand that, don't you? When he said, I am the resurrection and life, he's talking about him going to the cross, being buried and being raised from the dead third day. 
they had missed that. Now, it was very clear in Jonah, right? And he told them about Jonah, and he told them all this stuff. They believed in the last day resurrection. What he said they didn't understand is that the Messiah had to bear a cross before he could wear a crown. And they weren't getting it. <laughs> Nobody was getting it. I mean, his followers, we're talking about followers now. Loyal followers just weren't getting it because it didn't jive with their previous instructional understanding. And so he's breaking new ground, isn't he? I mean, it, I mean all the Gospels is about bre breaking new ground. The incarnation broke whole new ground in Israel. The coming of the Messiah. They thought for sure that he was not going to ride on a donkey. <laughs> they thought like we think and when we're in eschatology. But anyhow, so he says in verse uh, 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, and, and here is it connected to the cross. We shall not all sleep. That's a euphemism for a believer's death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now he's going to talk about that change in a moment. I mean, a split second, we would say. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. See, that they didn't have that part. That's the mystery part. They didn't have that. They're waiting for the last days and hmm. For, and listen, had the Jews believed, they'd be in the rapture, right? If they hadn't died prior, but I mean, Jews. For this perishable must push on, put on imperishable, talking about the change. Now we're talking about the change. The perishable, that's the human, that's natural body. The perishable shall put on imperishable, and the mortal shall put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, he, he quotes from the Old Testament, doesn't he? And then he goes on, oh, death, where is your victory? That's what they were missing. Oh, death, where is your sting? Sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, what a breakthrough Paul got. See, Paul came out of the old school, and um, he went, wow, I never, I never had these connections before. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, talking to the church, be steadfast. L listen, it, this, verse 58 is enormous. If you don't, I mean, you're going to say to me, oh, I don't know how many times I've heard the rapture of the church. I know that. I know that. I mean, this is not new ground for you. Verse 58 could be. Verse 58. In fact, verse 58 should be new ground for you. Because it says, if you really believe in the rapture of the church, then this is how it should affect your life. Listen to verse 58. Therefore, see, remember, every time you see the word therefore, you say why for. Well, he's just told you, verses 50 through 57. The mystery of the change that's going to come before the resurrection of the last day for the Jew. You understand that? Yeah. Therefore, my beloved, this is, this is what this doctrine, how this doctrine should affect your life on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, making it personal. My beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's how you should live this. If you really believe in this, this is the way you should, this is the way you should live, right? Verse 58, a, so the idea is if you really believe in the rapture of the church, if you really believe these things, if, if you're a follower of Christ and really believes in that, that you should be about the Lord's business. When he comes, as far as the church business, you know, reaching men with the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that, as far as the church is concerned, we're all going to be gone. The work is done. 
So while your feet are still on earth, your work is to be done. Because when your feet are going up, the work is done. So he tells you, be steadfast in the work. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Well, these are tough words. Where are these for a while? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the dynamics. I want to show you, Paul used five Greek words in explaining the rapture of the church. Each of these ha are significantly important as far as an important doctrine connected with the rapture of the church. Okay? So, we've outlined them for you. Um, like the one we're talking about, change. A lasso. Sounds like a cowboy, doesn't it? Yeah. Got his a lasso. Uh, but um, this is the word change, and we'll talk about that. There are other ones too. But Paul talks about the mystery, the rapture of the church, which this is as a discussion about, that is has in it a resurrection, right? When the when the rapture comes, there's going to be a resurrection connected to it that's connected to Christ. Now, we already know what he means because he described it in the 15th chapter, verse 20 through 23. Listen to what he said. Now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man, that is, you know, Adam versus Christ by 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 a man came death that's Adam first Adam by a man also came the resurrection of the dead that's the last Adam right see we know that from the same chapter right uh, verse 22 and verse 45 see we're in the same chapter but I just read the end of it you see but it's a powerful chapter isn't it it's a very powerful chapter so he's already described he's already he's uh, as in Adam all die and Christ are all, all made alive, right? Then he goes on, but each man in his own order. And he's talking about the resurrection. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who Christ at his coming, that's us. That's the church. Then comes the end. That's what we're reading about. Daniel's 70th week and then the millennium. See, there's going to be an order of the, what we call the first resurrection. That is the resurrection of believers. And, and the whole order is about, starts with Christ, then it goes to the church, then it goes to the Jewish age, then it goes to the millennial age. You understand? There's an order to it. Christ the first fruits, then those who are at his coming. That is the rapture part of the coming and the second coming to the Jew. See, when you talk about the second coming, you're talking about, you're talking about to the Jew. When you talk about the rapture, you're talking about the church. Whoa, 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 you do know that. Okay. All right. Well, anyhow, let, now let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence to believe a priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's classroom etiquette. If you want to, if, you know, if you really want to study the Bible, then it's got to be under the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't study it in carnal and get anything. How do I know I'm carnal? Well, there's awareness of personal sin in your life. It could be it could be mental attitude sin. It could be sin of the tongue. It could be overt sin. But you're aware of it. The Holy Spirit has been grieved. He's been quenched. He's convicting. All of that is part of the identity of it. Then what you, you should do with it is 1 John 1, 9. You should confess it through your priesthood, 1 Peter 2. Confess it. Name it. Cite it. State it in, in your own heart as a priest before God because the work for it the cleansing of it has already been done. God wants you to get back in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not about, this is not about salvation. It's about sanctification. It's about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Cleansing not for salvation like in verse 7 of 1 John 1, but rather for sanctification. The Spirit teaches the human spirit the truth of God and it frees his soul to live for Christ without baggage. 
Father, we're so thankful for your mercy, love, and grace. And for these that have come with us both by automobile and by the Internet, we pray they would take serious the preparation to study under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and the third chapter, where he really deals with it in the third chapter. And so we pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth about the, the, the significance of the rapture of the church and why we will not go through the tribulation and why we will be taken. Uh, uh, and so we pray you would show us these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul began our discussion today by calling our information, verses 50 through 58, um, uh, uh, a musterion which is the word mystery. Now, the word mysteri mysterion is a little different than what we might think in the English. Um, and so I want to I, I explain it. But he, he, he talks about it. Behold, I show you a mystery, a mysterion. We, and here it is. We will not all sleep. We'll all be changed. All right? So he's, he's telling you what the mystery is about. Okay? And, and this is why. This is why, you can, as a communicator, if you run across, if you're in a study and you run across the word mystery, you're obligated to this principle. Watch this. A mysterion or a mystery, a biblical, a biblical mysterion or a mystery, a biblical mystery is always the object. Now get this, is always the object of divine revelation. Pete, good to see you. Hello. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah. Good to be vertical. Um, it's always the object of divine revelation. Always the object. Now get that. It's the, the mystery is always the object of divine revelation. In, in, in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 3, Paul wrote, that by revelation there was made known to be the mystery. By revelation. See that? By revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. In other words, what the mystery is about. Then, as I wrote before in brief. Now, if you go on and study the third chapter, which you're obligated now because he put the word mystery on you. See? So you could be lazy and just blow by it. But it's all about that, isn't it? So if you go on and study that, what the mystery was, and it, a mystery means that it wasn't revealed in other dispensation, is special for some reason other than this. So, so in this Ephesians 3, if you went back and you looked at it, maybe you will, just so you could learn how to deal with a mystery, how to, how to interpret a mystery when it's, it's stated. Uh, this one, if you go back and you study, you will see that what the mystery was that Jews and Gentiles, now watch this, would be treated equally in Christ. Now see, I get, I, get, I get a charge out of that being a Gentile. Okay? Don't put me in no back seat. I ride in the front. I, shot, I got shotgun. Put me back there. So th this is really important. If you go on now, now Paul also wrote about this, and and he wrote this same idea. This is not the first time he wrote about it. He wrote about it in Galatians, in the third chapter, uh, towards the end of the third chapter. He wrote about the same thing. He said, he he, he did away in Christ. There is equality in Christ. You know, male, female, equality in Christ. You remember he went through the whole thing, rich, poor, whatever. Uh, that's very important. So, w when you run across the word mystery in the scriptures, you're obligated with the word to pay attention because he's going to explain it because there's divine revelation being given about it. Okay? I just want to give you, we have two good examples here. A mystery also refers to a divine revelation not yet revealed in previous dispensations. In other words, this one is a real, real, uh, real interesting one about it because there, the resurrection is discussed a lot in the Old Testament. It, it is a pr prominent belief that there would be uh, a judgment 
and the righteous would be separated from the wicked. There will be a, a resurrection of the righteous and there will be a resurrection of the wicked. And it certainly will happen. See, there's a mystery attached to it. See? You go like, uh oh, something different going on here. Right? So, so once you learn that, you get really excited about finding they're like on a scavenger hunt or something. It's finding clues. And when you run across the mystery, you go like, whoa, I got me a doctrine here, boy. I got me something big time. So don't pass them over, but you do have to be a student to figure it out. It's not hard. You just have to understand that. So here, here's one. Uh, here, here's one that's, that's interesting. It's Colossians 3, 4. It says, when Christ who is our life, now I'm getting back to my subject. When Christ who is our life is revealed, panare o oh, oh, revealed. When Christ who is our life is revealed, what in the world does that mean? Say, when Christ who is my life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Oh, this is a way of talking about Christ coming back, but not describing it as second coming. And so we have a word in here that's giving us a clue. What is really interesting, and I lay this out for you, and, and we've studied this. We've just about studied everything, haven't we, people? <laughs> I mean, after you've been here 44 years, there's just not much left, is there? But there is, there always is some left. It's amazing to me. It's always something. Well, anyhow, rapt the rapture is one of 10 important mystery doctrines of the church age. So, listen, if you haven't gone through my study before, I don't know when I'll ever get back to it. <laughs> but it's a great study on the 10 mysteries, the, the mystery doctrines of the church age. And it's not hard to find. You just go through and find the word mystery and study it. <laughs> it's a really good study. I might do it later. I don't know. But our first one is the word Alasso, A L, a double L. Well, you, it's on your paper. <laughs> it's translated into English change. <laughs> it is the first word I want to introduce you to on the rapture because it was identified as a mystery. But the, the whole rapture is a mystery. Remember that now. And I'm going to give you five different Greek words that describe five different aspects of it, of the mystery of the rapture, right? Here's the first one. In, in our passage of 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That is, you know, die and, you know, the wonderful thing about the church, listen, to be, to be absent from the body. I mean, you know what absent from the body is? Yeah, this is what Paul calls asleep. That's what he calls asleep. It's a believer dying and going to be with the Lord, to be absent of the bodies, to be present with the Lord, isn't it? Where do you think he is? Third heaven, wherever that is, right? I know it's not on earth because he created the heavens and the earth, so I know I'm some other place. Um, so that, so it's kind of interesting. He's, he says, we'll not all sleep, and the word is a euphemism for a believer's death. Uh, but we will all be changed. <clears throat> Wait a minute. You're saying we won't all die, but we'll all be changed? Like, in what way? See, and he's talking about after death. Some people, <clears throat> some people will get the resurrection body because they're already dead and with the Lord in heaven. And other people will get it <clears throat> without going through death. They will be living and they will go... <laughs> from living through death into a resurrection body. Those who are, are with the Lord today are not in a resurrection body. They're waiting for the rapture just like we are for their resurrection body. 
The change comes when he comes. I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And then he goes on in a, in a, in a split second, in the twinkling of an eye, the, the perishable, which we, are, we have in the living form today, the perishable will be changed to imperishable. The immortal become, the mortal will become immortal. Right there it is. Without experiencing death. I don't know. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I mean, how, how would I even know what that means? I mean, everybody I've ever known had to die. I'm just telling you what I know. Now, the greater passage for you to study is 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through, through at least 44 to show you that at the rapture, those who are alive and are in a, a natural body, which is perishing, right? It's aging and going to death. Is it, but at a split second in time when the Lord comes in the air, not to the earth, but into the air, we're going to go from perishable to imperishable in a split second of time. Boom, there we are. That's better than alley-oop when he used to st step into that little, well, anyhow, alley-oop. I know. Yeah. Uh, the and the mortal become immortal. All right? It, listen, how quick is it going to go? There it is. I mean, I don't know, right? That's amazing to me. We're the right generation for that. We're instant everything, right? You slap something in there. It normally would take two days to cook. Now you get it in two minutes. There it is. In a split second. After reading 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, which I read, we read, write the change on your paper. Just write the change. Write the change that comes with the rapture of the church. Alas, alaso means to make other than it is. That's what this word means. It means to make other than it is. That's the word change. Vines gives that definition. It's a good one. But everybody's going to follow that. Wherever he got it, he, he's fine. So, you know, it's the last writer. That, that's, a good, that's a good definition. And you know what that is? That's the, that's the resurrection for those who are, are resurrected at the, at the coming of Christ, at the rapture. You're going to get your resurrection body. Boom. And you're not going to go through death to get it if you're alive. That's going to be some more. God. I mean, you haven't, had a, you haven't had a thrill ride in your life ever that will compete with that. Right? You talk about your heart being in your throat. That'd be one, wouldn't it? I guess. I don't know. I wouldn't get on those things. They get up there and I think, yeah, and that thing gets stuck or that thing tip over or something. Of course, when you're young, you don't think that way, do you? No, it's a 50-year-old man at least thinks that way. It's sown a natural body. Paul talks about 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. So he's talking about resurrection. Sown a natural. In verse 49, he says, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, in the resurrection, we will bear the image of the heavenly. People say, well, what kind of body do you think we're going to come back with? A heavenly body. What's that mean? I don't look up in the air. I don't know. <laughs> You're not going to find any replica of it down here on earth, right? So the nearest thing is just look up in the heavens, whatever you see going other than the airplane. Because they got land. So my point. Rapture will institute the dispensational order of the first resurrection of believers. Yeah, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. We talked about that, right? Okay. That's, here's the second word, harpazo. Harpazo is one of the most misused interpreted words in the Bible. I, I remember, I've told this story, and I'm not going to go, but Hughes and I, Rick Hughes and I were coming home from a, a preaching engagement. 
And this guy, we we had nothing. I mean, we we were we were getting down the road on fumes, right? I mean, we had we had, <laughs> and this guy. We were listening to different guys on the radio. We was coming out of Mississippi, and this guy before before we got to Mississippi border, he he told us that. If anybody could prove from the Bible the rapture of the church, he, I forget now what the I used to know the money, but as you get older, the money either gets bigger or your whatever. I don't remember, but listen, it could have been five dollars. We'd have, we'd have called. I mean, we had nothing, and um, boy, we, 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 that was going to be the easiest money we ever made in our life. So Hughes was driving. He said, "Get that word out. And I'll have him on the phone before we get to the Knicks." and Boy, I was flipping through. I had all that, boy, because, you know, the rapture, that's big-time stuff. And I had it all laid out. So we pulled up, and back then, you didn't have cell phones. We had to get out of the car and, and you know, dial, find a little, right, find a pay phone. We invested what little money we had into this stupid goal because that money was ours. We laid all this information out of and he, he, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Well, anyhow, God taught us some great lessons, didn't he? You bunch of dummies. <laughs> but anyhow, it comes over this word harpazo. This a harpazo means to snatch, seize, or catch away. Vines again. And I, I mentioned vines because he's a guy you got, it's a very, he's got a little book on, uh, Hebrew words and Greek words that you can go to a store and it's a very it's a wonderful book it's very simple and it's very affordable <laughs> and so I, I I quote him a lot hoping people actually go get this thing but I don't get anything out of this um, but this this Greek word is harpazo the rapture the word rapture is a Latin word it, it's it's been influenced by the Latin language there is no Hebrew word or Greek word, but the Latin word is rapture, but the translational word for rapture out for Latin, the Latin got it from the Greek harpazo. It was the way the Latins interpreted harpazo. In Latin, it means rapture. It means the same thing in Latin that it does in the Greek. We tried to explain that, but of course, Jesus spoke the King James Version, and so this guy wasn't going to listen to us. Uh, the, the, so, harbazo, the word rapture is Latin. So when somebody says, well, the, the word rapture is not in the Bible, go like, okay. It's a Latin word for harbazo, okay? <laughs> or else just say, okay, and leave it alone. It is used for Paul's experience recorded, and I find this interesting. Paul used this in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 2 through 4. And Paul is talking about when he was caught up to the third heaven. You remember he was on a, a missionary trip, and they stoned him to death? And he was caught up. He said, I don't know really if I died or if I didn't, but I had this experience that was real whether or not. And he talks about it. Well, the, when it says he was caught up, that is the word that is the word that we would interpret. That's harbazo. That would be rapture, except this wasn't. But it, it, it is so similar to the idea that it just take, kind of takes your breath away on it. So Paul is the guy who, who takes this word on the rapture and, and develops it. He, he goes from there and develops this whole, whole concept, a whole concept out of harbazo from his own personal experience, which I find. See, he... Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15, he writes 2 Corinthians, and half the rest of them. But anyhow, so he caught up, when, when, you, when you read, and Paul was caught up to the third heaven or to paradise, the word is harpazo. Harpazo teaches that all living church age believers will be raptured. Now listen to me, here's the word harpazo. Harpazo means that all church age believers will be raptured whether they're, they're spiritual or carnal, whether they're a spiritual baby or a spiritual immature or a spiritual mature, right? Or a reversionist, or right? We all go, man. 
we all go. We're all going to be caught up. And it just depends how we're going to be caught up. But it's going to be quick. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be harpazo. Okay? We're going to be caught up. And there's none of this, oh, I, I would like to, can we do this tomorrow? I've got a hair appointment or something. Harpazo means you're going to go. You're not going to go. You don't have any. And listen, therefore, we ought to have this wonderful attitude about whenever it comes, I am ready. I'm excited. This is going to be something. See, rather than, well, you know, I'm supposed to get married tomorrow at 2. Well, I mean, see, there would be a lot of good things you could say, well, I'd, if we could plan this rapture maybe next year at this time, if in case my marriage doesn't work out, <laughs> then I'll go for the rapture. Therefore, when we, get, when we try to f put our head around something, we, we, we do First Thessalonians 4.17, talking about the rapture, then we who are alive and remain, boy, that's, that's a key. You see those two words? Now, I don't have to explain alive, but what about remain? What, what, huh? Yeah, but why, I mean, why not say that? Why, why say remain? You know what, you know what, the idea? I've been, I, I've been left. I mean, you, you talk about this shooting here that really, you know, the remain, the remain, the people who remain, the ones that, actually was able to walk away from that deal, whatever. They were dead. They may have been towed away or, or, or you know, I towed it away. I can't believe I said that. I just said towed it away. I'm so Southern. Yes, you are. I'm so Southern. Uh, then we who are alive and remain, where, where are the other people that should be? Well, they're asleep in heaven with the Lord, right? And remain. We who are alive and remain. I say, I love that. This, this will preach at funerals. May not get anything for it, but it will preach. <laughs> it may not give you anything. But. Then we who are alive and remain, and here's our word, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet. Who are, who, who? Those who have gone before us. The cloud to meet the Lord in the air. Where? Air. Where? Where? We're all airheads now, aren't we? In the air. Not on the earth. That's a key. And thus we what? Shall be with the Lord always. So this is, we ought to be practicing that, shouldn't? Be with the Lord always, right? <coughs> that ought to be what we've been practicing because a big game's coming, right? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Here's the third word. The third word associated with the rapture is a parousia. It's a compound word, para, which is a preposition, means with, with, and um, like uh, I heard a couple of teen, teens the other day talking about who you going with. I went, oh gosh, I remember those days. Vaguely. <laughs> Who you going with? Are you going with anybody? And I thought, hey, that's Pyra. Do you know that's Pyra? <laughs> I don't know that I should have broke in that conversation that way, but that's the word Pyra means with in that regard, with, with someone or with meaning there is a, a reason to be attached, para. And then uzia, uzia is a, a form, it's a verbal form of the word aimi, which is an absolute status quo verb of existence in the Greek language. It's a very important verb of, of identifying something that has uh, a, 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 an important existence. I mean, in English, when we use the word is or was or something like that, it's a helper just to get us someplace, ain't it? I mean, it's just a crutch from one point to the next. But in the Greek language, 
when he uses the word Aini, it puts an, a, a, an, ex, an, an important existence attached to whatever the, whatever the verb idea is. So it becomes pretty, this, and we, we call it the absolute status quo verb of existence. But, and so it's used. The, the, and so these two words put together is the word, uh, the coming, the rapture. It is a compound word. It, when you put these two words together, it means to, to be or preserve or to arrive uh, together with. Uh, you know, who are you going with? Um, and this is often translated coming. This is part of the idea of the second coming is the idea. But if this word is used in, now Paul uses it, and I, th I wanted to uh, show you how this word was used apart from eschatology, uh, how it was used in everyday life. This word was used. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 2.12 on your paper. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence, parousia, See that? In other words, that when he comes, there's going to be a, a something going on together. We're going to have a Bible study together. We're going to go golfing together. We're going to go dancing together. We're going to go hear Sam sing. We're, we're going somewhere. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. See, when he said, and, and this is an interesting translation used to explain something within scriptures. So then, my beloved, just you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Now watch, he puts the negative on the front of this, but now much more in my absence. When I don't have that, I'm not able to come and have that fellowship with you and have that Bible study with you and see how you're doing. And, you know, just see that word is used two ways in that. I just find that. So I wanted to show you that. Now, back to how it's used. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, this word is used in regard to our subject matter. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after those who are Christ at his coming. He uses the word parousia. Parousia. And where is he going to come? He's going to come in the air. See, I'm in Corinthians. He's going to come in the air. Right? Not, not, not to earth. Those who are on earth that believe in him are going to go up to meet him in the air and so forever be with him. In 1 Thessalonians 4.15, 1 Thessalonians 4th chapter 13 through 18 talks about this same discussion. But for, he, he writes, Paul writes, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming, the parousia of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And what are they, what, now you have to go on and read more, but what he's talking about will not precede them, meaning we will not get our resurrection body first. Those who he comes with him, they will come, they will receive their body first, and then we, at the same time, in a split second, will get ours. First come, first serve, stuff I guess. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, okay? Just start, try to get that. Now, how long is that period going to be? Uh, how quick? Split second. I, probably, than split second. I would think so. I was, I was about to say, I don't know how quick a split second is, but this will be quicker than that. 1100 of a second. Well, there you go. Millisecond. Huh? Millisecond. A millisecond. Real now I know why I came. <laughs> A millisecond. A millisecond. What'd you, how'd you say it? A millisecond. I don't know. Milli? A milli? I, okay. Well, that's quick. But, well, apparently, or, or understand it. <laughs> uh, I see. Therefore, my point, the rapture carries the idea of sudden, agreed? Sudden, whether expected or unexpected. But it would be sudden in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 
the dead in Christ will be raised and we shall be changed in a split second for us. The, the fourth Greek word uh, is a compound word and epi is on the front of word. Look at the word, see the word synagogue? If you take that you, like in the Greek, and put the y, which they often do, then you have synagogue. This is an epi synagogue or it is a, ga a gathering together. This word in the Greek language teaches there will be a gathering together of all church age believers, both the living and those who have died. And we're talking about church age believers. Right? Christ being the first fruits and then, and then those at his coming. This is discussed in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, and it is worth your reading. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, this word is used along with the word parousia. <clears throat> now we, re we request you, brethren, regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He uses the word parousia. He's not talking about technically the second coming, right? I'm using this technically now. The rapture precedes technically the second coming. Even though actually you could put both of them under the same banner, I'm talking technically a difference. Are you with me? Because we're going to see the second coming of Christ when he comes back and uh, rides the big horse and, you know, we've got the tribulational thing. So I'm making a distinction there even though one triggers the other. And so we often banner them together. I'm technically making a difference. We request you, brethren, in regard to the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is rapture, and our gathering together to him. <clears throat> See that? And it means an, a, an important assembling. This isn't just a regular outing. This is like a big deal assembly. <clears throat> this is like the Super Bowl or something. In Acts 1.11, we're told more about this when he says, uh, Jesus, you know, he's just about ready to depart uh, from the first coming. And they also said, Men, and, and they, and, you know, the angels are talking. And they said to us, and he said, men of Galilee, I, I, always, I always love it that they're always given instructions how to represent the Lord with people they meet. A wonderful study in the Bible is to watch how the, the at least the main players, guys like Gabriel and guys like that, when they come, they're, they're given protocol how to address certain people. It's always amazed me. Uh, just courtesy, I guess. Just uh, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you get, as you gave, as you have. Yeah, there you go. Be sure to change that. As you have watched him, I kept reading that over and I went, well, there's no way I can get that. You have watched him go into heaven. He's going to come back the same way, right? All right. Therefore, we understand that the rapture will take place in the sky and not on the earth as it is in the second coming. The literal. Now my final word for you today. Wow. No, nobody, nobody clapped. And thank you. Now my final word. Because everybody knows. That it'll, it'll be half an hour. My final word. <clears throat> now we've had this word before. Faniaia. But it has epi on the front of it. Uh, Fani Ro'o, we had it earlier, means to appear. But when you add the front of it, you add the epi, the preposition on the front of it, what, what it teaches is a visible manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ at the time of the rapture. A visible manifestation. But what is interesting about this, now it would be true in the second coming as well. Well, what is interesting about this, only church age believers are able to see him. Now, when he comes back in the second coming to the earth, every eye, every eye will see him.
Do what? The, in, in the rapture, only the church age believers will see him. Only church, uh, the rest of the world won't see him. They won't, they won't recognize it. They won't. But in the second coming, when he comes to the earth, everybody, every eye will see him, the Bible says. Yeah, the second coming. We'll be with him. First, first, Thess uh, first, uh, first Timothy 6, 14 and 15. That you keep the commandments without stain or reproach. Until the appearance, there's our word, until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. In 2 Timothy 1.10, and now has been revealed. There's this word revealed. See, it's the same word in a verbal form without epi. See how, the, how a preposition can flip a word? Now it has been revealed, revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Therefore, we learn that Jesus will be visible only to church-age believers. Now, let me tell you, I, now I want you to write down a Bible verse. I want you to write this down at the bottom of your paper. I got a couple I want you to, want you to write down. I want you to write down 2 Timothy 4.8 and Philippians 1.6. Now, you've already, you've already, you know I emphasized 1 Corinthians 15.58, didn't I? Right? So you've already got that on your paper. If you haven't, write it now. Philippians 1 6. Right? Second, Second Timothy 4 8 and Philippians 1 6. And then you should have somewhere in your paper with emphasis on 1 Corinthians 15 58, right? The importance of what the doctrine of the rapture should hold us to in our everyday life. Right? Be steadfast, uh, immovable type of thing. Now, here's what's interesting. If you have your Bibles, let's, let's, let's read a couple of these passages to show you, once again, the dynamics of the doctrine of the rapture to your, to your life. Uh, I'm at 2 Timothy. And why you should be, why you live your life in regard to a relationship with Christ, always walking with it. You're benefited by doing that, aren't you? I mean, you're highly benefited by walking with the Lord every day in your life because he is your power source. He is your best friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the other thing is to the awareness that at any point, at any day, boom, he's there. Now, Paul brings this out in uh, 2 Timothy 4.8. And, and this is that, you know, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. You know, I have fought the fight. I finished the course. Now, listen to what he says in the future. He says, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Now, I mean, everybody in this room can get this. I mean, you want this crown. You want this crown. This crown is going to be dynamite in your next life. You're going to wear this crown in the next life. This crown is high cotton. Come on, Southern people. This is high cotton. In the future, there will be laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, and we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ day, right? And not only to me, but watch this, but also to all who have, a, who have loved his appearing. You understand that? I mean, when he comes, it's going to like, Happy days and glory. Happy days are here again. I mean, there's a crown to love, to love, to look forward and love the coming. I mean, the writers in the, in the New Testament, there's a key word, and everybody used to say it after church and things like that. Come, come quickly, right? Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I mean, that used to be... Well, anyhow, here's another verse. I, I want you to go to Philippians with me a moment, and then we're going to wrap this up. I want you to go back up a little bit here, back over here, Colossians, Philippians. Uh, and I want the first chapter, and I want verse 6 here. I 
I mean, you know what the what when you really pay attention to rapture, what it'll do? It'll re or it'll it'll reorganize your life. If you really understand the rapture and believe in it, it will reorganize your life on what's what 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 is the top of your priorities and how you should look at it, and how important it is to be sure that the people we really love and care dearly about are going to be with us in this journey because you do not want to be left. You leave then what I'm studying on Samuel, Daniel's 70th week will be the reality of your life and this will be this will be the seven worst years of anything you could ever possibly imagine. And so, so it, listen to verse 6. Now I love this word confident. I am confident. You know how you get there? You study the Word of God. You cycle that through 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed is profitable. That God-breathed means inhale, exhale. You study it. You bring it to a place of faith. And then you live it out. You live that doctrine out of your life. He said, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you who do you think that he who? Huh? He who. That he who. We know who that is. Right? We know that's the Lord. He who began a great work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Right? I mean, we, we ought to be until, listen, I, I, confidence within our own life structure of who's in charge of it and has been since the day he saved your soul. And you ought to let him be in charge of it. You ought to let him be in charge of it. Until the day. Right? Until the day of Christ Jesus. And for that, for that day for you and I is the rapture of the church, isn't it? Yeah, Horton. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do that one day. Okay. Yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, you betcha, buddy. Well, you know, I'm a guy who don't really like to talk about what the Bible doesn't teach as much. I think if you know what the Bible says, then you can argue your positions to anybody, right? And so I, I always hate going, but I will look at some of that stuff with you. But I hate talking about what is not true. I don't like to spend five minutes on what's not true because I think if I teach you half an hour on what is true, you can talk your way through anything. I mean, you got you, anything you believe, you've got to back up with the Word of God and it's got to be stable. You can't have just one passage. I mean, you've got to, it's got to, it's got to line up with other passages to be truth. And so, yeah, but anyhow, um, Dwight Pentecost, yeah, he does. All those theories. Yeah, on the, all those theories. It, it, that's a great book. I just think about all the time that we don't have the expectation that we Yeah. Yeah. And that's something? How does that work? I mean, that's just. It's this way. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, but what a great life it is in Christ. Well, uh, let's let's have a word of prayer, and we'll we'll dismiss our internet people. Um, hope you on the internet will pick up a copy of this off the internet. You can pick a copy up. Uh, be sure to look at all the passages, study. Just go on our web. It it ought to be up there within a a week. Probably quicker than that, but John will have it there. And follow along with us as we go through this series. But for a believer, the rapture of churches, you need to really take this and put it under your... Yeah, I was going to say that, and I thought, well, I need... put it in your heart and live it out. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and the Internet. I pray, Father, as they study with us, they will read these passages and, and let the Holy Spirit teach them the truth. All I do is teach what I know to be the truth. And it, it's, 
the Holy Spirit's job is to bring it into the reality of each person's life as absolute truth. That's where confidence comes. Knowing the Spirit of God has recorded it, documented it, sealed it. That's an amazing idea. Sealed it in my soul. And that it will carry me through all the times of the earth. I'm so thankful for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.